Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and researcher of Japanese war heritage. This week we are joined by Professor David Ria of Chuo University to discuss the once dominance discourse of Nihonjinon, or Japaneseness, which has shaped many aspects of Japanese society over the last century through its ideas of Japanese uniqueness and group consciousness. David gives us a brief history of the discourse, how a discourse can shape society, and new discourses of internationalization and individuality, which he argues have seen the decline, if not the end, of Nihonjinon as the dominant narrative in Japan. As there are quite a few Japanese terms thrown around in this week's episode, a brief glossary has been included in the description below. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Dave. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on. So, first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Okay, sure. Um, so, I came to Japan about 20 years ago, I think just after I graduated uh, university,、uh, intending to stay about six months, as a lot of Westerners do here, but、uh, never quite leaving.、Uh, it's a fairly common story.、Uh, so, when I first Uh, worked here. I worked as a business English teacher, teaching、uh, Japanese executives、uh, in their offices. And occasionally I'd bump into executives who would kind of complain about the recruits that they had. I think it's a fairly common story, not just in Japan, but everybody likes to complain about their standard of employees or their standard of education. And so these executives <laughs> would say that Japanese education was not providing、uh, their recruits with the skills that they needed for business. And so I kind of began to get interested then in a little bit about Japanese education and looking at what Japanese companies said they wanted from new employees, what kind of skills they wanted, generic skills, this kind of thing, and how that corresponded to official Japanese education policy as expressed in Ministry of Education, white papers, or prime ministerial speeches, and so on. So, this is the late 1990s and early 2000s that I'm talking about. And so that led to a PhD on Japanese education policy and Japanese work skills, looking at it from a discursive analysis direction. And then on to other papers, looking at sort of specific keywords that structure together Japanese education policy. And that connects to what we're talking about today, which is Nihon Jin Don, as we'll find out. Great. So now, Nihon Jindon, or Japaneseness, is a pervasive idea that crops up across many fields in Japanese, from heritage to colonial studies, pop culture, and so on. Could you give us a breakdown of what Nihon Jindon is and how this concept came about? Sure. So, as you say, it's、uh, Nihon Jindon, or theories of Japaneseness, if you like,、uh, has been called Japan's dominant identity discourse. What we Tend to think of as Nihon Jinron today, probably came out from、uh, the 1970s and 1980s when it became a really popular discourse. Lots of lots of articles and books written about it, both within Japan and outside of Japan. But actually, as a discourse, it's a lot older than that. It's just it's changed quite a lot over a hundred years or so. So it probably started in the Meiji period, so in the, the 1870s. So, after the fall of the shogunate and when Japan was forced to open up their borders to foreigners for the first time in 250 years, and the emperor took power once more, Japan began to realize they had to play catch up to the West. And so, a discourse emerged that was quite self critical, really,、uh, about why is Japan. So, backward technologically in comparison to the West, why is it still feudal in nature?、Uh, and how do we catch up、uh, to where we should be? So, it was a self critical discourse、uh, at that time, but it did have the effect of discussing Japan as a totality. So, I'm not really a historian of this period, but until then, I think、uh, most people identified themselves not really with the country of Japan as a whole, but with their specific region or, or clan, the kind of more like the feudal idea. Whereas in the major period, they began to discuss Japan as、uh, a country. 
And so that eventually led on into a slightly more negative direction under in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, when Japan became very militaristic. And the ideas of Japanese identity then moved towards the figure of the emperor and sacrificing yourself for the good of the nation and for the good of the emperor. After the defeat in the war, it then turned again into a self-critical direction as Japan sort of so well, what did we do wrong and how do we catch up again to the more sort of democratic institutions of the West? So there was a period of self-reflection, if you like. Uh, but then as the Japanese economic miracle took hold in the 60s, 70s uh, and 80s, suddenly there was a need, if you like, to explain, well, how has Japan suddenly risen literally from the ashes of the war to become this modernized nation in which living standards rose uh, dramatically over a very short period of time. And part of the interest was from outside, from economists or, or business studies uh, researchers wanting to sort of copy or what, see what we can learn from the way Japanese people do business. This whole idea is Japan as number one. But also within the country, a sort of quite self-congratulatory discourse, if you like, well, what has made us suddenly so successful? And so that's the discourse in the 70s and 80s that we really understand of as Nihonjinron. So to, just to summarize what they would say was that, first of all, Japan is a homogenous country. It's one nation with one identity, and that its culture and its people are uniquely unique, more unique uh, than other countries. And that other countries can never truly understand what it means to be Japanese or can never truly understand Japanese culture. You have to be born here. You have to have a Japanese soul, if you like. And then some specific ideas that Japanese have very strong group consciousness in contrast to the sort of individualism of the West. They're more willing to sacrifice for themselves, for the good of the company or for the good of the country. That Japan is a vertical society in which social obligation and indebtedness and shame take precedence over sort of Western values of individual rights or duties or conscience. That Japanese culture values harmony rather than conflict and emotion rather rather than Western rationality. And there was also an attempt, I suppose, to explain, well, how on earth did this come about? And they, they tend to then go back to Japanese rice farming culture, that apparently rice farming required more collaboration uh, within communities compared to Western farming techniques, if you like, Western crop farming, and that this sort of created the Japanese social consciousness that then became the basis for the culture as a whole, including for the, the, the Japanese corporation, uh, which supposedly retained this sort of family group conscious idea. So it was a discourse that became quite nationalistic in tone, really, that the idea that Japan is unique, other people can't understand Japan, and really Japan is unique and probably superior to other nations, as it sort of seemed to be at that time. Uh, I don't think that's how they view themselves now. I think we're going to talk about that later or next. But that was the, the discourse of the 70s and 80s that we understand of as Nihon Jinlon. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that concise answer. In your paper on a critical analysis of Japanese identity discourse, alternatives to the hegemony of Nihon Jinlon, you suggested that alternative discourses of kose, or individuality, and kokusaika, internationalization, have disrupted the cultural dominance of Nihon Jinron and its related concept of kokoro, or heart, or soul. Could you explain this for us in more detail? I can. Um, I should say, first of all, perhaps we can talk about it later, that I think Nihon Jinron has died down considerably, uh, whether you say it's disappeared or not uh, now is a slightly different question. And discourse uh, is only one aspect of that, o obviously just the fact that Japan has had a long recession and, and facing a population crisis, all these things have certainly served to dampen the self-congratulatory tone of the 70s and 80s, certainly not self-congratulatory now, if anything, it's self-critical. Uh, they've gone back in, the cycle has come back, if you like. But yeah, in terms of the discourse of it, 
So lots of scholars have examined Nihon Jinlon, often in a, a critical way that famously uh, Befu's book of 2001, I think, uh, Hegemony of Homogeneity, uh, was very critical about the ideas of Nihon Jinlon, pointing out their, its logical flaws and so on. I was kind of interested, because my background was discourse analysis, I was interested in the sort of key words within Nihon Jinron that sort of structured the discourse together, that held it together. And there's words like kotodama, which is used to describe the uniqueness of the Japanese language, and ie, house or household, family or household, which was also used to describe the Japanese corporation. But the real key word in Nihon Jinron in, is probably kokoro, heart or soul. A lot of Nihon Jinron books and articles uh, use the word kokoro in the title, Nihon Jin no kokoro, Nihon no kokoro, Nihon go no kokoro. And so kokoro kind of encapsulated what it means to be Japanese. And by implication, uh, an outsider, a foreigner could never understand kokoro because they're not born as Japanese. Now in the 1990s and early 2000s, a sort of succession of uh, Japanese prime ministers, quite socially conservative Japanese prime ministers, not that they're particularly liberal now, but they were particularly in those cases. People like Modi, who became the Olympic chief, who's just had to resign, Koizumi, and Abe in his uh, first stint as prime minister, much less successful in his first stint than his second one. And they were very keen. They had this idea that Japanese young people were somehow losing what it, the sense of what it meant to be Japanese, these traditional ideas of self-sacrifice and, and things like that, and becoming too selfish and individualistic. And so they began to push in education policy, a sort of return to these traditional values. And the word they would often use to describe it is kokoro. And so it cropped up again and again in Japanese education speeches and Ministry of Education white papers. They also began to push for more moral education, dōtoku kyoik, to sort of inculcate traditional Japanese values back into the the curriculum within schools. Uh, actually, Shinzo Abe wanted to be called Aikoku Kyoiku, patriotic education, but I think that was a step too far uh, for people. So it ended up as Dotoku Kyoiku. And the Ministry of Education produced a textbook for use in schools. It wasn't compulsory, but they did collect data apparently on how far it was being used. And the, the name of this textbook was Kokoro no Noto, or Note for the Hearts, in which junior high school students were supposed to discuss and learn about what it really meant to be Japanese. And so I'll, I'll give you one or two quotes from it. So it's meant to be a discussion textbook, but the discussion were, were very much one way. So for example, what does it mean to fulfill your role within a group? Discuss a time when you felt that fulfilling your role within a group was hard, but good. How can you improve group-centered life? How can you cultivate human relationship so that each person can shine within a group? And don't you think people are getting more selfish these days? So this was all God. encapsulated. Yes, it was, it was pretty frightening stuff. Again, this is the early 2000s, I should stress. It's not today. And it also had ideas about loving your country. We should love our country and pray for its development. It was quite pre-warish, really. But again, centered around this word, kokoro. But at the same time, there were other key words within education policy at the time, which were being defined in certain ways, and certain groups within society would define it one way, but there were competing meanings also available because language is not immutable. It, it evolves and different people articulate words in different ways. So you, you can't just fix the meaning of something but they would attempt to. And two of these words, as you mentioned, are kose, which translates to individuality, and koksaika, which means internationalization. So kose in itself sounds like quite a, a liberal concept, individuality, almost the opposite of uh, group consciousness. But these socially conservative politicians like Koizumi, Mori, and, and Abe would define kose kind of in two senses. One, in a neoliberal sense, Japanese education had, all, had often been in a kind of lockstep mentality. Everybody has to be treated the same. And they wanted more diversified schools, so schools specializing in 
this and this, and students able to skip grades if they were bright enough, and this kind of thing. And that was all encapsulated in this phrase, kosei jushi, a respect for individuality. They didn't mean the individual personalities of the students, they were talking about individuality of the schools and really fighting against the teachers' unions who were opposing these reforms. They would also define kose as a kind of talent or skill. So Koizumi made a speech in 2002. Uh, we want to imbue our children with pride and self-awareness as a Japanese national so that they can grow up as people with abundant individuality and talent, yutaka na kose to noryoku, who can shoulder the work of new nation building. So in other words, individuality was a skill that you could learn and then put to use for the good of the nation. Uh, so a sort of a nationalistic take on the term. However, kose is a word that's in general use within society. And so however powerful a politician is, they can't just fix the meaning into what the, the sort of narrow utilitarian usage that they're aiming at. Uh, it takes on connotations of its own. And so within general society, for example, advertising or job advertisements or conversations on TV, in the media, whatever. Kosei was often tied with another word, jibun rashisa, which means being true to yourself, which basically is talking in a, a very individualistic fashion about not doing what everybody else tells you, what your company tells you, what your school tells you, but just being yourself. And so you would see these two words cropping up together quite often. I'll give you a quote from a lifestyle uh, magazine website. Jibun rashisa kose o mitsukeru hoho. How to find one's uniqueness, jibun rashisa, and individuality. I once analyzed some job advertisements from Japanese companies and found this one. Minasan no kose jibun rashisa o misete itadakitai. We want you to show us your individuality and uniqueness. So in this sense, kose is almost very much against Nihonjin Ron, the idea that everybody has to be the same and Japan is all homogenous. This is, this is saying that everybody is different and we're all individuals and we can all act as we wish to. So that's how Kose, I think, undermines Nihonjin Ron. And the other word you mentioned is Koksaika, internationalization, which is around for a long time. But often when it was used originally in the 80s and 90s, uh, Japan had pressure to internationalize and open up their markets, but it was often used in, again, in a fairly nationalistic sense. If we look at outward koksaika, in other words, Japanese people going out into the world, first of all, you have to learn English. Uh, and then the reason you learn English is so that you can explain Japan's viewpoint to the world and advance Japanese interests abroad. And inward koksaika, so act, having foreigners admitted to the country, very much emphasize the differences between foreigners and Japanese. And it was almost discursively creating a barrier. These people are different. These are Koksai people. We are Japanese. It's really the job of the incomer to adapt to the Japanese culture and Japanese norms. However, again, uh, as the years go by, Koksaika has taken on different connotations, not just from the sort of articulations and conversations of ordinary people, but the elites, as Japan's population crisis has grown more severe, an economic crisis and the labor shortage, they've realized that actually Japan needs to internationalize properly. And so Koksaika now is often associated with another keyword, taiyose or diversity. And the discourse of diversity is very much like the discourse of diversity you might find in a Western country, saying that Japan needs diverse viewpoints, diverse people, diverse values. We should all respect each other's diversity, uh, tolerate differences, uh, and live together, uh, coexist peacefully while respecting differences, uh, but also um, getting along together. And Japanese business group, for example, Nippon Keidanlen, uh, the elite Japanese business group, has even tied Koksaika and diversity into specific plans for admitting large-scale immigration into Japan. What they're really worried about is labor shortages, so you can argue how much they really care about diversity and everybody living peacefully together, and it's really just to bring in to solve their labor shortage problems. However, the discourse of Koksaika, I think, has changed a great deal over the past 10 to 15 years and is 
almost diametrically opposed to the idea of Nihonjin and, and Japan being a homogenous country. So that's how I think discursively Nihonjin has been undermined over the past 10, 15 or 20 years. If I might throw in another concept, this juxtaposition of individuality with group mentality seems to be the two sides of the same coin of Orientalism, this uh, colonial era idea of the Orient being an alien other from the West. From what we've discussed so far, it seems like there's this, this mentality in Japan of we can be more Japanese or we can be more Western. Would you agree that Orientalism is a strong influencer in Nihonjinon and this idea of individuality? Uh, I certainly think it was. Uh, certainly Nihon Jinron was based on the idea of self and other, uh, the West being the other, and, and the, the West itself being defined as one entity. No sort of differences between Western countries. It was the West versus Japan and, and nothing else, really. Now, I think things have changed dramatically in Japan. There are far more foreigners living here, certainly in Tokyo where I live, it, it may be a little bit different uh, in the countryside, but far more foreigners who are visible in Japan, working in convenience stores, in companies, in shops. So that Japanese people now, I think are just becoming more used to seeing and dealing with foreigners uh, on a daily basis and realizing there's nothing really to fear and that they're basically the same as us. And this old idea that foreigners can never truly speak Japanese because they're not born as Japanese. I think that idea has largely gone away because they see it on a daily basis. And there's plenty of foreigners on Westerners, example, foreigners on, on television, on as serious commentators on news programs, speaking fluent Japanese and their views being respected just as everybody else's are. So I think this idea of self and other, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can say it's completely gone away, but I think it's far less strong than it used to be, at least in, in my experience and, and my opinion. Yeah, I just feel like on a more personal experience level of uh, when I was living in Japan that linguistically in the language of Japan, that there does seem to still be like this very big, clear divide between uh, Nihonjin Japanese and Gaikokujin, which is foreigner, which seems to categorize anyone who's not Japanese. So it still seems to be like a very stark black and white sort of dividing line. So I just wonder if that's a leftover from the Nihonjinon mentality. Um, I suppose it is, yeah. I, I think it probably just comes from the fact that historically there have been relatively few foreigners here and they have been seen as different. So. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. There is that still that dividing line between Gai Kokujin and Nihonjin. And, and Gai Kokujin, uh, strangely, Gai Kokujin tends to mean Westerners. Uh, but there's, there's far more Chinese and Koreans here than, than Western people. They're just not quite as visible and they, they uh, fit in better and they tend to speak fluent Japanese. And so Gai Kokujin is sometimes applied for them, but it's generally applied to Western people. There are, of course, far more half Japanese people living here, like my own children, uh, who are sort of bridging this divide. And they're, again, seen as different, not necessarily, well, sometimes seen as cool. That, that, that idea still exists. And the fact that they can speak English is cool. But I have to be a bit careful how I do this because I'm a middle-class yeah. white guy and a university professor. I'm in a very privileged position within Japan, so I don't feel any sense of xenophobia. I think if you're from Africa or Asia, the Middle East, yeah, life can be a, a very different story. And if you're the children of those people from those countries, uh, there it might be a bit different. My children uh, haven't really felt anything like that, though they do go to slightly more internationally-minded schools. Uh, there was a case, wasn't there, of the Japanese contestant from Miss World a few years ago who was from of half African, I think, and, and half Japanese. And there were some mm -hmm. complaints within Japan that she didn't look Japanese and that therefore she wasn't Japanese. But I, I still feel that it's not as strong and, and not as negative an idea as it once was. An interesting mm, stat is uh, in 2019, I think, uh, the coming of age ceremony in Shinjuku Ward in Tokyo, so new 20 year olds, new adults, one in eight of the people who attended the coming of age ceremony in Shinjuku were born overseas. Uh, 
one in eight, they were mainly students, I think, from Ryugakuse, foreign students coming into Japan. So certainly in Tokyo, those people are so visible now that I think those kind of old ideas of Nihonjin and the us and them are slowly fading away that they certainly haven't gone away completely and and my experience is probably not typical but I, I feel that Japan is changing more so in the last I've been here about 20 years more so in the last 10 years than it did in the first 10 years I was here I think you're also seeing more tolerance for more ideas about uh, equality for women so for example you'll have heard probably Mori's the Olympic chief's uh, disparaging comment about women talking too much in meetings. And there's an absolute outcry uh, in Japan as well as overseas. And he was forced to resign, which is quite an unusual that they're actually forced to resign over something like that, but he did. Also more tolerance so it's discursively to work for the gay community, whereas in the past, I think they've been a sort of a figure of fun. I think that is uh, changing now. And, and if you talk to young people in Japan, they'll just kind of say, well, who cares? You can be whatever you want to be. It doesn't matter. So those kind of ideas, attitudes, I think are catching up, if you like, to, to ideas we might have in, in the West. And I think they probably go along with ideas of individualism. As Japan becomes a more individualistic society, those kind of ideas of more tolerance for diversity and diverse viewpoints, diverse lifestyles seem to go hand in hand. So I also see that as a weakening of the stranglehold, if you like, that Nihonjin and Ron has had on Japan until relatively recently. Yeah, definitely. I think Tokyo is the most cosmopolitan space in Japan and where you can see these most progressive ideas coming forwards. I know that living in the countryside five years ago, it definitely still got a lot of staring on the streets. But to go back to the uh, um, the topic of today's podcast, so your paper asserts the power that these concepts have on Japanese society, but it may be difficult for some to understand how a discourse can influence, shape, or dominate a society. Could you explain this idea of discourse theory and give some examples of how a discourse can play out in society? Yeah, so the idea of discourse theory or critical discourse theory, if you like, is that discourse both reflects and influences society. It's a step too far to say that discourses uh, control society or control what people think, uh, but they often limit the terms, if you like, as to how things can be discussed. So in a Western context, perhaps uh, neoliberalism might be uh, a good example of this. So the, the language of the market and how pervasive this has become now, for example, in, in Britain. So the idea of students as being consumers, as what they learn being outcomes or competences talking about value for money and, and things like that and competition between universities and between schools and between hospitals. So the language of the market. And so these words like freedom, for example, freedom to choose or accountability. These ideas have become so pervasive in society, it's almost hard to argue against them. They've become sort of the level of, of common sense. In a more basic sense, we can just talk about how media shapes attitudes and how the language of media can influence our attitudes. So one obvious example is sexist language. So using he instead of she, or using they instead of either of them, using fireman instead of firefighter, chairman instead of chairperson. So these kind of things matter and they do change attitudes. They, they sort of... So us making the decision to start using the word firefighter, for example, rather than fireman, is partly because our own attitudes are changing and we recognize that women can become firefighters, but it also has an influence as well in it because it changes how we discuss the very occupation of fighting fires. So that's a sense in which it's a sort of dialectic relationship going both ways. Nihonjin Ron, I think, is an example of a discourse that became incredibly powerful. It's hard to say why it did, just plus the sheer volume of works that were produced in the 70s and 80s, like hundreds of thousands of books and, and articles, many of them becoming bestsellers. And the fact perhaps that the outside world also bought into it and contributed to it, brought about this situation which Nihon Jinron came to define what 
Japan is and would always be. It was, it was as a sort of immutable idea. This is what Japan is and, and it will never change. I think it has changed, but that's, that's, I don't know if that answers your question, how discourse can sort of influence how we think and how we, our own identities, how we view ourselves and how we view our societies. Yeah, those are some very good examples. Thank you. So, Nihonjinon is tied in with this racial idea of Japan being a homogenous nation. That is to say that all Japanese are ethnically and aesthetically the same. Incidents such as students in Japan with naturally light brown hair being forced to dye it black suggest that such notions are still prevalent. While it has been argued that this originated from theories of eugenics from the Japanese empire, do you believe this concept has systematically persisted into the modern day? In a short answer, no. I mean, there is still the idea that Japanese people look a certain way. They have black hair, but that, to be honest, most of them do have black hair. There are some with naturally brown hair, which is the issue about the girl being forced to dye it black. We'll talk about that in a second. And then you have the idea, of, we mentioned that the half Japanese Miss World or contestant for Miss World who didn't look Japanese. So that idea probably still does exist in, in Japan, I think. The specific example you gave, without wanting to be controversial, I, I suspect that has been overblown somewhat. So the situation was, it was a school in Osaka, I think. Japanese schools tend to have very strict rules about appearance. So about the school uniform, hair being a certain length, no braiding, no curls, that kind of thing. And so this was a girl whose hair looked light brown. And the school examined the roots of her hair and thought, saw that the roots of her hair were black. So there are rules, so I should say, you must not dye your hair. That, that, that's the, the rule. That they, the roots of her hair were black, and therefore she must be dyeing her hair brown. And the girl said, no, I'm not. This is my natural hair colour. And the school didn't believe her. And uh, she began to dye her hair black, because she thought that was the only solution, or they demanded that she do. Uh, and that caused her a great deal of psychological uh, distress. And so she stopped dyeing it uh, and then they effectively suspended her. Uh, and she left the school for several months, I think. And then after she left, she sued the school. This is why it became a new story. She sued the school for sort of uh, emotional distress and she won the case though she didn't win very much money out of it. She didn't get nearly as much as she hoped for. Um, one reason is because the judges, they also examined her hair and they said there's no evidence to say that her hair is not naturally brown. However, the roots of her hair are black. So they admitted that the school did have reasonable grounds for thinking that she was dyeing her hair brown. So that, that was the actual case. Uh, so it's not quite as straightforward as a school saying everybody must have black hair. That, that's not the rule. The rule is you must not dye your hair. Uh, and they thought she was, and she said she wasn't. And the court found that she wasn't. So she was telling the truth and the school were wrong. And the school were forced to pay damages because they overreacted and refused to believe her, I think. So that was the case. So we, we have to be a little bit careful. Sometimes we take little incidents in Japan and they, they make the newspapers in Britain or around the world and we draw all these conclusions from them uh, without examining the actual details uh, of the specific case. And they might not be quite as sinister, if you like, uh, as they seem to be. So in my view, this case is one of those. It's not quite as bad as it appeared to be. Thank you for that uh, clarification. In conjunction with homogeneity, Nihon Jinon builds on the notion of Japan being a group-oriented society as opposed to supposedly Western individualism. Do you believe Japan is still a group-oriented society today? And what bearing does that have on the influence of Nihon Jinon? And uh, finally, could you share with us your thoughts on the future of the discourse? Um... Is Japan a group-oriented side? Whatever that means, I'm not 100% sure what it, what it means, to be honest, or whether, whether anybody knows what it means. The short answer is, I don't know. It's, there's various uh, surveys that are being conducted in Japan and every country around the world trying to measure people's values and attitudes. One very large one is called the World Value Survey. This has been going on for, I think, 20 or th at least 30 or 40 years, I think. According to that one, Japan is very individualistic. 
and that it's ranked almost at the top of one particular value dimension, which they call the secular rational dimension, and saying that Japanese prefer individualistic striving over social conformity and express low levels of deference to authority, low levels of national pride and low levels of nationalistic outlooks. This was in 2000. I'm quoting from a, a study in, in 2000. There's also been studies of young people's attitudes to work and finding that they don't want to devote their lives to their companies. They want to do the job that they want to do. They want to do work that is personally fulfilling. So in that sense, certainly an individualistic society, and you don't see many elements of group consciousness. I sometimes wonder whether the results that these surveys have found, Japan being very individualistic, is perhaps a reaction against Nihonji and Ron, where we don't want to be pigeonholed into this. We sometimes perhaps feel ourselves as Japanese that we are forced into certain roles, but we don't want to be that way. Uh, we want to be individuals. At the same time, there are other value surveys which have found different conclusions, that Japan is still relatively group-oriented in relation to the West, and that one study in 2012 by Hamamura found that the percentage of people choosing respect for individual rights as an important moral principle actually declined between 1963 and 2008. What I do feel is that there, there may be a gap between people's desires and attitudes with the reality of life within organizations or institutions in Japan. The, the, the culture, for example, of the Japanese firm emphasizing very long hours, deference towards the boss, uh, not leaving your office before the boss, being seen to work hard, those attitudes are still pretty prevalent in Japan. Even though anybody you would talk to, any sort of middle-aged office worker you want to talk to, will complain bitterly about how hard they have to work and how they just want to be at home with their family. And yet, somehow, they're trapped into this culture, which still forces them to work long hours and still values FaceTime, being in the office, I mean, rather than outcomes and results. Also within schools, probably the, the, the senpai kohai, the, the senior-junior relationship, which in the past has been very severe, particularly, for example, in sports clubs where the, the kohai, the junior, has to basically serve almost like a servant to the senior uh, and use respectful language, whereas the senior can use any language they like to the junior. Those attitudes still exist within schools, but I suspect they're not as strong as there used to be. And there used to be, I think, almost a bullying nature. I think bullying is very much looked down upon and I suspect wouldn't survive very long within a club in a school nowadays, uh, though I'm sure it does exist to some extent. So is Japan an individualistic society? I don't think you could say it is, but you might want to say that people would like to be more so if they could. I'm not sure how controversial I'm not uh, arguing necessarily from any empirical basis. That's just a feeling I, I get from living here and working here. It's going to be interesting to see if anything changes with people working at home more over the past year. And Japan has not embraced it quite as much as Britain did, for example, but certainly increased a great deal. And some companies have said they're going to continue with it. Whether that actually will finally be the thing that breaks Japanese business culture and allows people to sort of be judged only by their results, uh, regardless of what hours they work. Uh, it would be very interesting to see over the next five years how that develops. Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, refreshing to think that people are rejecting or, you know, trying to break free from these labels that are applied to them. Thank you for answering my questions. Uh, before we finish the episode, could you share with us what projects you're currently working on? Yes. So um, I've always been interested, uh, ever since, in fact, the Japanese business executives I mentioned at the start of this, talking about how they're not happy with the new recruits they're getting, uh, the idea of critical thinking in Japan and critical thinking and education policy in Japan. So uh, there has been a, a complaint 
usually from Western universities, for example, Australia, about Asian students, Chinese students. So it used to be Japanese students, now it tends to be Chinese students, not being natural critical thinkers. And it's almost a pervasive discourse there. My personal view is there's very little empirical evidence to say that Asian people, it's a horrible generalization for a start, uh, that Asian people uh, are not natural well, critical I'm thinkers. Sure. Yeah, it's absolutely awful. And it's, I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that when, for example, Chinese students study abroad, they have to do their studies in English. And it's very hard to express yourself fluently in, in a foreign language when you're writing essays or in class discussions and so on. So I'm looking into attitudes of critical thinking within Japan and comparing critical thinking in the first language in Japanese with critical thinking in English and seeing what uh, differences emerge into that. So that's my current uh, focus. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you very much indeed. You can find a link to David's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Andrew Littlejohn of Leiden University to discuss disaster heritage around the Great East Japan earthquake of 2011. This heritage typically consists of ruins from catastrophic natural disasters that, while initially may be preserved for commemorative purposes, can end up being articulated to attract tourism to sites of mass death. We also explore the legacy of this heritage and how it addresses the relationship between humans and the natural environment. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.